Anyways, so what we're here and why we're engaging everybody, uh, obviously welcome. Hope everybody's doing well and safe, their family, friends, obviously. Uh, the reason why we're doing these, these Zoom meetings is so everybody get informative information. And obviously here we have Elston here, the foremost expert in the sulfur aspect. That's why he's gonna talk about nutrimental sulfur and then nutrimental phosphorus as they both relate to our uh, soil health objective, delivering low salt fertilizer for high soil productivity and longevity. So we got, everybody knows how to use this function. There's a chat tab. We're gonna have Elston go through his presentation and then uh, we'll take questions after the fact and Elston can see the questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can in a timely fashion. So we're about to have a half an hour of presentation time and then whatever, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes of question time. So with that being said, take it away, sir. All right, I will. If I remember how to do this, is it working? Yeah, so far so good. This morning, I was on a conference uh, Zoom call and it uh, wasn't working so good. So I'm glad that it's working now. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's Alston Solberg here. I'm happy to be with you all this morning and I hope in the next hour or so, uh, we can share some information and answer some questions that uh, allows us all to be more confident in the huge yield potential that's sitting out there for uh, the growing season of 2020. I was just looking at the crop intelligence um, data from a number of the probes and also cross-referencing some crop plans and uh, there is a lot of crop available water in the profile. Um, so we're actually set up for a big time uh, yield potential sure. this year. And for some of you, um, we have the opportunity to grow two crops or take off two crops this year. So uh, let's get going. Um, there's my email. There's my phone number. If you guys want to text me or email me, please feel free to do that. I'll be, uh, there'll be another slide that, like this at the end of the presentation. And I think Dax and company are uh, recording the call, so um, or, or the presentation, so it'll be there as well. Um, first, going to talk about biosol. Uh, biosol has been in Western Canada now for I think six or seven years. Um, it's a very very simple product. Um, it's that it is easy to uh, relatively easy to apply once every four or five six years. Uh, it's comprised of thirty percent compost and seventy percent. Uh, elemental or nutrimental sulfur. Um, it also has microbes in the compost, which initiate the breakdown of the nutrimental sulfur um, to sulfate sulfur, which is the plant available form. The particle sizes of the of the sulfur inside of biosol is actually the key to the brilliance of it. Um, there's particle sizes everywhere from one micron up to perhaps 4,000 microns. The small guys convert quickly because of the vast surface area. And as the particle size increases, the rate of conversion slows down and that's how we get slow biological release over a period of several years um, uh, from a one-time application of 220 pounds per acre. Uh, there's some guys putting on more than that in, in potatoes. There's the odd guy putting on 400 pounds. So all you have to do is uh, blast it on the soil surface and then forget about sulfur in those fields for the next four, five, six years, which in and of itself is, is pretty brilliant. One of the main things, especially in a year like this year where people have crop out and maybe didn't get some fertilizer on in the fall and stuff like that. It's, uh, it's a big time logistical play that also has a, a very strong agronomic foundation because every crop we grow requires sulfur, whether we want to believe it or not. It's a time saver, it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Some of the guys that I'm working with tell me that their spring seeding is speeded up by about 20% through the use of biosol. And again, 
you know, it's super simple. It's 30% compost, 70% sulfur as nutrimental sulfur. The particle sizes are, are varying in size from very small to, uh, you know, one micron to 4,000 microns. It's, it's a great strategy. There's great logistics. There's great agronomy and um, it's the cheapest form of sulfur out there on a per pound basis. Um, and people have been doing this for many years. So now I want to take you to some, a very simplified uh, presentation of 200 or summary of 247 fields that I looked at in 2018 and 2019. So these were field scale trials of Biosol, uh, various years after application. So anywhere from two to five years up after application and several types of crops, okay? So 247 fields, various stages after application and multiple crops. And this is what I learned from this horrendously large amount of data. One field was low in sulfur. We're using tissue tests here. Soil tests for sulfur, for determining sulfur deficiency or sufficiency is pretty much a waste of time because of the variability of sulfur across fields. Um, Tissue tests is where the action is. And uh, one field out of 247 tested low in sulfur. Here's where it gets uh, really cool though. 57% of those fields tested low in potassium. 51% of those fields tested deficient in boron. And every other nutrient of consequence was somewhere between 4% and 13% deficient. So my take home message from these 247 field scale trials, um, different phases of the program, different crops is that Biosol works. And we, of course we've known this for years, but there's still a lot of doubters slash haters out there that will tell you nutrimental sulfur, blah, blah, blah. Um, Biosol works. There's bigger fish to fry. Uh, one of the areas that we as an industry need to focus uh, greater on is potassium and boron for sure. Some of the guys I'm working with are broadcasting both of those nutrients. Some of them are broadcasting phosphorus on a variable rate basis to even out the variability of those nutrients across fields and optimize the entire package. Because at the end of the day, it's all about balance. And sulfur tends to be one of those nutrients that, uh, that helps the uptake of other nutrients. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, now here's a data set that I swiped from Matt Gosling and his crew. It's uh, probably one of the biggest data sets in, uh, in North America that deals with a single nutrient. And what we're looking at here is nearly 5,000 soil samples taken over a period of many years. And in the good old days, um, Matt Gosling's customers were on an AMS program they were using ammonium sulfate every year. And then after many years of cajoling him, uh, begging him, prodding him, threatening physical violence, he moved to a nutrimental pro a program at that time called Tiger 90 for three years. And then after seeing success with that program, he moved uh, to Biosol. And what we're looking at here essentially is the difference in the soil tests as we went, or as he moved his clients from program to program, and I don't think uh, there's much disputing the conversion from that annual AMS program to the T90 to the Biosol is showing up in the soil samples. Um, yeah, there's some variability. I actually would have expected more, but the proof's in the pudding. The stuff is working. It's being converted from nutrimental sulfur to sulfate sulfur, it's showing up in the soil after a very aggressive period of years of managing sulfur. So that's one thing, over around 5,000 samples. So if you want to think like a plant, um, tissue sampling is where it's at. And so the next piece of this puzzle is uh, the tissue samples that <laughs> Somebody needs to be muted. So, uh, tissues uh, were taken while he was doing this. And again, it's the same setup, 3,200 tissue samples, thereabouts, AMS pro program, convert to the T90 program, convert to the Biosol program. And you'll see as we move from AMS every year 
to Tiger 90 every three years to Biosol every four, five, six years, the number of tissue samples that are either normal or high are increasing in most crops, if not all of them. Peas is a little bit of an anomaly, but at the end of the day, the shift is obvious in the tissues, the shift is obvious in the soil samples. Um, I think based on nearly 8,000 and some odd uh, data points, there's not much arguing anymore about whether any of these programs work, but for sure the Biosol program. So maybe there's some questions at this point, Dax. This is supposed to be the coronavirus, by the way. No, we'll just keep running through just there. Keep, keep rocking, all right. So one of the things that we've known for a while, uh, I actually did some of the initial research work back in the middle 90s um, with a, another nutrimental sulfur producer and what we learned back then and what we've relearned several times since is that when you add nutrimental sulfur to the soil and it gets converted to sulfate sulfur, there's some biological acidity that's created uh, by the organisms that do that. And again, the smaller the particle, the greater the surface area, the more rapid the conversion. As the particle size increases, the rate of conversion slows down, which is really the magic of biosol. So if we can imagine those little yellow lumps in the middle of the screen are uh, particles of nutrimental sulfur in the soil. Bugs are working away on it. There's bugs in the soil, there's bugs in the compost. They create this three-dimensional halo of reduced soil pH. So the pH within that halo goes down. And what happens when you have a reduced pH? You solubilize or mobilize a whole bunch of other nutrients. So in this case, I've listed a bunch of the nutrients. And what that means is when a plant root is growing through the soil and it finds elevated levels of sulfur, it's also going to find ele elevated levels of these other nutrients, which is why we often see in our tissue tests that the not only is the sulfur are the sulfur levels higher, but also many other nutrients. And um, I'm calling this the halo effect. There's probably a better way to describe it, but if you can imagine this in a three-dimensional world, that's what's happening in the soil. So in, there's literally thousands, if not millions, of these little microsites in the soil where the biology is working um, in harmony with uh, the growing conditions uh, that the crop is seeing, and it's releasing not only the sulfate sulfur, but also these other nutrients. And there's plenty of uh, examples of this, so I just want to show you one trial. Back in the day, uh, there was a lot of concern that spring applied biosol wasn't going to work. We always had to put it on the fall, even though my research showed back again in the middle 90s that you can apply nutrimental sol sulfur in the, winter, uh, in the fall. You can put it on through a bit of snow. You can put it on in the spring, and you can even put it on after the crop is seeded and you're going, to get, you're going to see similar results. So here's a spring applied. This is field scale stuff again, up against um, not, no biosol being applied. And the yellow uh, circle is simply showing you that um, not only was the sulfur being released from the biosol to sulfate sulfur to the crop, the level of sulfur in that crop, much bigger crop, everything else, was dramatically higher and so that's a pretty cool cool thing but what we see in a lot of the tissue samples when this comparison is available we also see this we see other nutrients being uh, more expressive in the tissue samples as well and so again um, trial after trial after trial that looks like this is showing elevated levels of other nutrients and the theory is those nutrients are being solubilized um, in that halo of biological acidulation. And for people that are farming uh, high pHs, this is especially important. And if you think about it, some of you guys have been utilizing this concept for a while through the use of products like Jumpstart or Tag Team. That's the same concept, only a different uh, set of organisms. Critical tissue ratios that we need to think about, the very, very first one if we're talking about optimizing crop production and crop quality, the very first tissue ratio we need to think about is the N to S ratio. 
followed by the N to K ratio and the calcium to boron ratio. Remember, on those 247 fields, one field was low in sulfur, 57 were low in potassium, and 51% were low in boron. At the end of the day, if we can get those ratios in line, and back here you can see the ratios on, on these uh, tissue testing graphs, we can get those in line, then we will produce uh, more efficiently amino acids, with acids which get turned into proteins, we'll, we'll manage the water better, we'll drive roots, we'll create stronger cell walls, and we'll have better pollination with those three ratios. And so um, something for everybody on the call to think about. Back to this halo of, uh, of impact. Um, again, you guys, uh, have whoever has been using um, Jumpstart or Tag Team, you've in fact been using this concept to solubilize phosphorus out of this fertilizer or the soil. Um, plants themselves use root exudates that have cre are es essentially uh, organic acids that allow the solubilization of nutrients in the soil. And now we have nutrimental sulfur doing the same thing. So this is not a wacky new concept. This has been going on for ever um, in nature and in products uh, out there. So then I'm gonna shift a little bit to uh, another component that I've kind of relearned here by reading this book uh, that I helped uh, write a number of years ago. This was produced in 2007. They're rewriting it right now, actually. Um, it was a bestseller ever since, and what I've learned in this book, and then subsequently going down rabbit holes, chasing uh, new knowledge around sulfur, is that when plants are loaded with sulfur, and if we go back, if we go back to this, this this is a loaded plant. It's really hard to get more than about 1.8 percent sulfur into a plant. That's loaded. When a plant is loaded in sulfur, it creates all kinds of compounds that help the plant deal with stress. It creates phytoalexins, glutathione. When it's high in sulfate sulfur, it converts some of that sulfate sulfur back into nutrimental sulfur inside the plant. And that nutrimental sulfur inside the plant acts as a plant antibiotic. And if you think about it, um, the antibiotics that were first developed in several of them even today were based on sulfur um, as the base compound. What I've learned from Chakmak, Ishmael Chakmak recently is potassium helps control stomata, but the real controller of stomata is an amino acid that is created by sulfur, cysteine. And so what that means is that if we've got a plant loaded with cysteine, with sulfur, we, are, we have a plant loaded with cysteine, and we have the mechanism that controls stomata when a plant is undergoing drought stress. So we've got a stress fighter, a stress fighter, the antibiotic and another form of stress fighter inside the plant when there's a ton of sulfur inside the plant. Uh, same book, sulfur and, and zinc are about tied uh, in terms of the diseases that they impact positively um, uh, in, in a balanced fertility system. Here's club root. There's papers on this from a long, long time ago. Um, in other words, if your sulfur levels are strong in your soils and in your plants, then the plant is more readily able to handle club root, and there's a whole bunch of them. This was some cool work that Ishmael uh, shared with me, and it's actually published in the literature, so it's not, again, something just somebody just pulled out of their butt. But here's, um, here's three leaves that were infected with these different diseases. These leaves are growing with low sulfur, and up here, these leaves are growing with adequate sulfur, and you can see quite a, a large difference in the impact of those diseases on those leaves and ultimately on that crop, and it basically confirms some of the stuff that I just shared with you. And I think as a picture, it's pretty powerful. Uh, the papers are quite available on the internet, so if you wanna check it out and see if I'm full of uh, sulfur, uh, there, there's the reference. Now, moving on to, um, Every crop needs sulfur every year. These are some typical yields that guys uh, that I'm usually bumping shoulders with are trying to grow. Some are even growing more than this. And so this column is all about the total sulfur 
that's needed. So in order to hit 60 bushel canola, that plant needs to take up 36 pounds of sulfur per acre, and about two thirds of it is removed. Here's wheat, and here's peas, and could have malt barley and whatever else. Every crop needs sulfur every year. The reason every crop needs sulfur every year is because of these guys. These are amino acids that create proteins in all plants. And there's two amino acids down here. They're sulfur-based, cysteine and methionine. And it turns out that these two amino acids are the gatekeepers to the production of all of these amino acids, plus a whole bunch of other amino acids that are signaling systems inside of a plant. So what happens is if you're low in sulfur, you're low on these sulfur amino acids that control the efficient production of all of these guys and a whole bunch more. That's the reason every crop needs sulfur every year is because of these two amino acids. Now that's a lot of information, so forget it. That's the reason, now you can forget it, and this is all you need to remember. Canola desires one pound of sulfur for every six pounds of nitrogen that it needs to get to its yield goal. Pulses, peas, those kind of things, alfalfa, it's eight to one, cereals, corn, grasses, it's 10 to one. If you remember this, you can forget this, but that's the reason. Make sense? I hope so. This is the Mulder chart. Um, there's an interesting thing that's going on here, and I've looked at this many, many times over the years, but it wasn't until Mike Delinsky pointed out the obvious. There's only one nutrient not on this chart, and that's sulfur. And why is sulfur not on this chart? Well, because sulfur enhances the utilization of everything. So in other words, if a plant is loaded with sulfur, not only is it creating the stress fighters and the antibiotics and all of that sort of stuff, it's also enhancing the utilization of all other nutrients inside that plant so you have a more efficient plant. So that's sulfur. And I can just tell most of you are just on the edge of your seat, just like this kid, and you want to learn some more. So here we go. Let's move on to nutrimental. Well, can I just cut in on you? Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I, there's some questions here that are, I think, before we skip on to the replenish, just need to answer for these guys. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions is, what level of plant available sulfur is in irrigation water? Because we know we have in southern Alberta and other places, there's a lot of people that have irrigation. And, and so I think there's a, I don't know if it's a false sense or just misinformation to say that the irrigation water has a high availability of plant available sulfur. So could you clarify on that, please? Yeah, that's a common misnomer amongst uh, most of the industry. I mean, the misnomer is because I'm irrigating, I'm putting on a bunch of sulfur. Uh, where things fall apart is when you ask the grower or the agronomist if they've ever done an analysis of the, the irrigation water or the, the source water, and in most cases, 99% of the time they haven't. And so when you drill deeper into um, the uh, various sources of irrigation around uh, you know, the province and around North America, many of those sources are very low in sulfur. And some of them that do have sulfur in them have sulfur that's essentially insoluble. So it's, you know, my first re reaction was to say it depends, but that's what all agronomists do. But it does depend. Um, the main message from what I just tried to share is just because you're irrigating doesn't mean you're adding sufficient sulfur to your system. Um, if you haven't done the analysis of the, the source water and you haven't drilled into what compounds are, of sulfur are in that source water, um, you might be misleading yourself. The second piece to all of that is, um, is one of the reasons Nutrimental sulfur has been used in irrigation is to avoid leaching loss. So if you're irrigating uh, sandier type soils, loamier type soils, one of the things that irrigation can do is actually move um, sulfate sulfur out of the root zone. And now we have nutrimental sulfur added in those cases and it slowly becomes available. The third piece when it comes to irrigation is um, I don't know any irrigation farmer that irrigates every year at the same level of intensity. Some years they get a lot of rain um, and they hardly ever irrigate. So in that 
in that universe, um, if they're assuming that they're getting enough sulfur from their irrigation water and they're not irrigating, then where, where's the sulfur coming from? It's not coming from the atmosphere anymore, um, which is why we have more and more sulfur deficiencies out there. So um, it's amazing the amount of information you can find about that question on the internet. It's just uh, too bad that most people don't actually look for it. Bottom line message, do not assume that irrigation is providing enough sulfur because in most cases it isn't. So I got on that question. So another one here. Why is the S not showing up in the soil test results? I have a client that's used elemental S after three years going into this fourth year. I noticed that the S level is showing up as low. Well, the, the thing that's going on there, I presume this is Biosol or Tiger 90 program or Keg River, but the, the soil test, keeping in mind the variability of nutrients across fields. So if his soil tests are coming back low, um, you know, back in the good old days, well, we used to say if the soil test is low, then you need to go. In other words, you need to hammer on some sulfur. The soil test measures sulfate sulfur, not elemental sulfur. And um, therein lies the conundrum. So you put on 220 pounds of biosol, which is 154 pounds of sulfur. It's releasing biologically drip, drip, drip over a period of years. The crop is utilizing the sulfate sulfur as it's being released. Um, you wouldn't expect that there would be a huge amount of sulfur remaining unless you're a uh, Matt Gosling that's been at this for 16 or 20 years. So bottom line is the, sul the sulfur test uh, for sul the soil sulfur test measures sulfate sulfur, not nutrimental sulfur. Okay, awesome. So that's, that clarifies that up. That's why, that's why we always say that uh, soil tests are not the best sample. That's why we rely on tissues to tell us about what the plants are actually taking up, consuming, no different than a blood sample from a human tells us the health of the plant. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, if we go, if we go, what's going on here now? If we go all the way back to, um, go all the way back to here, right? That's exactly what this, these tissues are. They're they're the blood sample of the plant and you've got side by side plants field scale trials applied in a way that was previously thought to be not effective and one's got you know it's really deficient in sulfur and the other one's sky high and it's dragging along other nutrients um this is where the action is for sure you've been listening Dex. i'm quite impressed uh, we got one more question here and then we'll move on and then we'll yep. obviously answer some more. So how much water does it take to get nutrimental sulfur to move an inch in the soil? Not much. Um, I mean, there's a couple of things going on. I, I presume the question is, is around, uh, is around moving the sulfate sulfur after it's been converted. A certain per percentage of the nutrimental sulfur that's really, really small will move into the pore spaces of the soil just with the physical impact of rainfall or irrigation. You think about it, the average pore size is about 80 microns in size, which is not very big. Human hair is about 150. So the pore space, if it's 80, 80 microns and you've got a whole bunch of little tiny particles that are smaller than that, They'll move into those pore spaces with the water. Now, when it comes to the sulfate side of the equation, um, it's gonna depend a little bit on uh, the soil type, but let's take a, a loam soil. Uh, a loam soil, a foot of loam soil will hold about two and a half inches of crop available water. Um, if you only want it to move in one inch, um, so yeah, you, it, it will require very, very little amounts of water to move that sulfate sulfur into the soil. Um, what's two and a half divided by 12? 
about 0.2 inches. Did I do that math right? Yeah, about 2.0 inches of rainfall or irrigation will move sulfate sulfur into the top inch and along with it, with the nutrimental sulfur, whether it's from biosol or from replenish, the really tiny particles will move into the pore spaces and, and down into the soil. Because let's face it, nutrimental sulfur, uh, when it's first added to the soil, is essentially inert, right? There's no electrical charge, there's no nothing. It's an inert product, so a little bit of water will move that stuff into the pore spaces and into the top of the rooting system. Complicated answer to probably a much simpler question. Yeah, obviously. So obviously when we have snow, when we apply on snow, the snow will drive the particles obviously down through the structure of the soil, which will be beneficial as well, correct? Right, so sandy soil, you're gonna get more, uh, more transfer of the micronized sulfur or micronized rock phosphate that we're gonna talk about in a minute than you would in a loam soil. Loam soil is gonna have more transfer than the clay soil. So you gotta, you know, factor some of that stuff in too. But yeah, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to. Right on, let's go on through replenish. All right, so nutrimental phosphorus. So we started playing around with uh, biosol some years ago. Um, I've been playing with nutrimental sulfur for my whole career. So I guess we're getting up to just about 40 years. And uh, one day I had this hairbrainer while I was in the shower and I was thinking about what would happen if we welded um, reactive rock phosphate to uh, nutrimental sulfur uh, in a micronized environment. So in other words, what would happen if we micronized rock phosphate that already was highly reactive to nutrimental sulfur that was also micronized and then place them in, uh, uh, in the soil, on the soil, in the soil, would we not create um, essentially biological fertilizer plants in the soil? Because, you know, the big fertilizer plants in Florida and Redwater and wherever else, you know, they're two or three billion dollar plants and essentially what they do is they take rock phosphate from a mine someplace, um, they flood that rock phosphate with sulfuric acid. That sulfuric acid solubilizes the phosphorus. They extract the phosphorus in a, in to, and create a highly soluble form of phosphorus fertilizer. And then they um, push all of the other nutrients that are in the rock phosphate and put it into a great big mountain uh, that they have to deal with for the next hundred years as a environmental liability. What would happen if we put those two things together and utilize the, the uh, biology of nutrimental sulfur to release uh, the phosphorus and rock phosphate? So we did some incubations, they were positive. Uh, we did some greenhouse experiments, they were extremely positive and I'll share one of those with you here in a moment. Um, and so that was the genesis of replenish. It's basically trying to simplify some really uh, simple concepts. Uh, and so here we have, you know, nutrimental sulfur, it solubilizes the phosphorus, it has uh, microbes in the compost to begin doing that very quickly in the soil. The soil also has them. Um, and while the biological nutrimental sulfur is creating those halos of acidulation, it's also releasing other nutrients that are in the soil, but also in the rock phosphate. Uh, rock phosphate is loaded with other nutrients that crops require. And so that was the whole concept, and that's the genesis of what uh, nutrimental phosphorus or replenish was all about. It's kind of interesting when you start digging, you know, down the rabbit hole a little bit, and you start thinking about stuff that you should have remembered from uh, junior high or high school or university. This is the periodic table. Incidentally, the, this book is, is great if anybody's geeky like me. But one of the things that you have to relearn is that phosphorus and sulfur are side by each in the periodic table, and that gets your brain working on some stuff um, if you're thinking about it. And so really, you know, phosphorus is really important in crops for lots of different reasons. Sulfur is as well. We've talked about some of the benefits of utilizing uh, sulfur, getting high levels in plants that go beyond the actual growth of the plant, but into the stress management uh, etc. 
but I mean, there's some pretty important stuff going on there. And really the, the genesis, the other part of replenish is uh, we had lots and lots of guys asking us if we couldn't figure out how to kill two birds with one stone. And so the idea was that if you're out broadcasting this stuff or, you know, uh, whatever, uh, I guess, seed placing it or banding it, um, you're looking after two nutrients and not just one nutrient in a meaningful way. So that was the other piece of, of the puzzle that got Neil and I thinking about this. And then when you start thinking about broader issues, here's a map of uh, Western, uh, of the North America and the numbers of the percent of soil samples that are testing below critical levels. And those numbers are going up. So what that tells us is, as an industry, we're mining the heck out of phosphorus. We're also mining the heck out of potassium, sulfur, and all of the micros. And at some point, um, that dog don't hunt, as uh, one of my buddies would say on a regular basis. You're stretching this elastic band longer and longer and longer. And at some point, that elastic band breaks and the whole system goes to heck in a handbasket. So one of the subsequent goals of Replenish was to, you know, deal with some of the phosphorus and sulfur mining that's going out on out there, especially um, when you're dealing with, with the organic inter industry, but also the, the mainstream industry. And then if that rock phosphate is containing other minerals that plants need like calcium and iron and magnesium and you know some of the micros maybe we could help uh, reverse this trend that i was showing you here and instead of stretching that band further and further and further allowing it to con uh, contract a little bit and um, help move uh, crop production in the right direction so that was another piece of that puzzle so if you want to look at some of the fine details of replenish in a simplified version, here it is again, I've already said it. Repl replenish is basically made from micronized rock phosphate that is already highly reactive. All of these micronized materials have passed a hundred mesh screen. So the bulk of them are, all of them are less than 149 microns and some are as small as one micron. So again, the smaller the particle, the more reactive, uh, either chemically or physically or biologically. And so we've got micronized nutrimental sulfur welded together with micronized highly reacted rock phosphate um, loaded with organisms that start the whole uh, process going. And when the nutrimental sulfur is converted by the microbes in the soil or in the compost to um, sulfate, that halo of acidity is created, sulfate's released, and so are a bunch of other nutrients from the rock phosphate and the soil. And so in, the whole theory is about allowing Mother Nature, very simple processes, very simple concept, um, allowing those nutrients to become available to crops. And I'm just going to show you some of the nutrients that are involved. Uh, in the rock phosphate. So rock phos, it turns out that rock phosphate has got pretty high levels of calcium, really high levels of calcium. And for uh, most of the industry, most of the industry wouldn't recognize that calcium is the third most required nutrient by all crops. Nitrogen's first in most cases, potassium is second, calcium's third. The fourth most required nutrient by most crops in Western Canada is magnesium. So rock phos phosphate's loaded in calcium, magnesium, iron, and it has some boron as well as some copper, manganese, molybdenum, and zinc. That's a pretty good world, um, I think, from a plant's perspective. So again, using that same halo uh, concept, we're creating that, we're solubilizing these materials from the soil, and now we've got rock phosphate jammed up against it, and we're solubilizing not only the phosphate, but also these other nutrients from the rock phosphate. So now I'm going to take you to uh, the greenhouse experiment that kind of blew my socks off, and that's um, uh, where things kind of changed, at least in my, in my mind. So we're going to use canola. 
I look at canola as kind of the canary in the mine. It's very, very responsive. It's very, very expressive. It's, uh, it's like the canary, canary in the coal mine. Um, and so what we did, what we did, what the third party people that did this experiment in the greenhouse, I designed it, they carried it out. Um, is we grew canola, we grew wheat. I'm not gonna share the wheat results with you here today. I'm just gonna show you the canola results. Both were quite very positive. Normally what guys do when they grow a greenhouse experiment, they'll grow the plants up and then they'll sample the entire biomass. I decided that we would not do that, that we would divide the biomass into components. So we have the straw component, we have the inflorescence or the flowering component, We've got the seeds component, and we've got the total biomass. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, what we learned from um, this experiment. Here's the total biomass. So just a little bit of time down here, there'll be four graphs that look exactly the same. We've got a check treatment that's getting no phosphorus, no sulfur. It's getting everything else that it needs. We've got a treatment that's getting rock phosphate as the phosphorus material. We've got this treatment, which is uh, kind of replenish in uh, beta form, 70% rock phosphate, 30% biosol. Then we've got this beta pelletized version of replenish, 80% rock phosphate, 20% biosol in pellets. Then we've got uh, 1152 only, so we're looking after only the phosphorus component here with 1152. And now we've got 1152 plus biosol. So the idea here is we're trying to tackle the phosphorus and the sulfur, here only the phosphorus, here the phosphorus and the sulfur, the phosphorus and the sulfur, here only the phosphorus, and here neither one of them. Now this soil was really deficient and phosphorus and sulfur. The other thing that we overlaid in this experiment was one, one with these two treatments. So this is, these two are biosol and beta versions. We either mix them in the soil or we just surface broadcast them, which was kind of the surprising part for me. And you'll see with the total biomass that these two beta products look pretty darn good. You might argue they look really good, but we wanted to drill deeper. So now let's go to the straw. Well, when we analyze the straw, these two treatments aren't doing so good. And it's, I mean, the, the answer is, or the conclusion that is obvious, we're probably growing more inflorescence and more seed. So let's look at the inflorescence. Whoa, now we're really rocking things. Uh, these two treatments with these two different methods of application, are knocking it out of the park when it comes to inflorescence. Let's look at seed. Some of these treatments look pretty darn good, but when it when we boiled it down, for example, with 1152, uh, there's lots of pods and shit, but no seeds. And uh, there's an example of what of what we just looked at back here. I get out of there, right? So when we look at the seed production. The grain production from this experiment, which nobody does, they always do the by bi bi biomass, total biomass. There was no grain production from the check treatment, not a big surprise. There was a small amount from the rock phosphate. In fact, kind of surprises me that this treatment did better than that treatment. The two beta products blew everybody away, even the 1152 plus the biosol. And the surface application did just as good or better than the mixed in application, which is the piece that blew me away. So then the question becomes, do we need to pelletize it? Do we need to just mix it? Uh, fortunately, I think both of those forms are available. The bulk of the attention is being applied to the pelletized version because it has more flexibility in terms of application and stuff. But those were the first results we got well, they weren't the first results. Those were the, the, the results that blew my shorts off when I looked at the data after the third party people um, did all of the work. And I think that's it. There I am again. So 
I went over time, Doc. Sorry about that. But we still have time for some questions. No worries, no worries. So we got uh, a question here. And I guess, so what are the desired rates in N to S, N to K, and calcium to boron? It depends entirely on the crop and growth stage. But if I was to oversimplify it, N to S, we already talked about it, uh, six to one, right? That whole discussion, six to one in canola, eight to one in pulses, 10 to one in cereals, corn, and um, grasses. Uh, the end to K ratio is somewhere, generally speaking, depending on the crop, somewhere between um, 1.2 to 1.4 pounds of nitrogen per pound of, of potassium. And then the calcium to boron ratio chain uh, is dramatically different depending on the crop species because uh, canola needs a hell of a lot more boron than does, um, say, a wheat crop. They both need it. They're both really important because they drive roots. Uh, when they drive those roots, the efficiency of the plant to take up potash and calcium and phosphorus and everything else goes up dramatically. And the funny part of, of all of that, I've got another talk called, called It All Starts With Boron and Sulfur. Um, when a plant is actively taking up potash, it takes up nitrate nitrogen uh, much more efficiently as well. And uh, I'm looking at lots of soil samples um, for this up coming uh, season and they're loaded in nitrate nitrogen. So not only do we have uh, high yield potential, we also have a lot of nitrogen kicking around in the soil for some reason. Right, right. Another one here is uh, looking at the analysis of uh, replenish and all the nutrients, the macro and the micronutrients available, they're quite substantially uh, beneficial. Will you be able to cut back on any of these micros in other applications or totally eliminate them? Uh, good question. Um, I, I, well, the way I look at the way I look at biosol and replenish, especially replenish is that it's not a, it's not necessarily a, a replacement product, but a, um, it's, it's more of a building or a background or a, yeah. So whether we ever get to a, a position where we're able to eliminate some of the uh, some of the micronutrient application, I guess time will tell. But uh, my main focus with replenish is is to begin to slow down the mining of phosphorus and sulfur in the soil, while also adding some of these other incredibly important uh, not trace nutrients, but other nutrients that most of the industry don't even think about, even though calcium and magnesium, for example, are the third and fourth most important nutrients. Um, back to the, the previous question. So here's, here's an example with canola. Um, at this growth stage, you know, any tissue sample will give you what they expect for the ratios at this growth stage. Um, and so here we're expected to be at 4.2 and we're actually at 2.4, which is amazing. Um, here the NDK is at 1.4 and we're at that. You hardly ever, ever see this. And then when you get over to um, the calcium to boron ratios, and this is, this is one that we never see, is uh, the lab's expecting about 900, a ratio of about 910. And we're much lower than that, which is good. Uh, you almost never see this kind of stuff. So um, I know I'm kind of bouncing around here, but if you guys are taking tissue samples, you've got all of these ratios on your tissues for that specific crop at that specific growth stage. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so basically the lab takes analysis of the plant at the specific growth stage, and they have a, a database of millions Exactly. millions of data sets and so they basically compare your tissue to what the plants at that stage historically have exactly right? Right. exactly awesome uh, another one here how is non-mobile foss a part of the replenish getting into the soil when surface applied Okay, so again, I think the, the answer there is, and we're, 
you know, we're going to have to do some research to, to uh, prove this theory. So again, if you, the average pore size in a soil is point is 80 microns. Most of replenish phosphorus and sulfur, or a big piece of it is less than 80 microns. So with a little bit of rain, um, some irrigation, what's happening is those inert pieces, micro pieces, micronized pieces of phosphorus and sulfur, because they're smaller than the average pore size, are getting washed into the pores and slightly into the soil. That's the only possible way in my mind that this thing is working the way it is. And if you think about it, both of those forms, elemental sulfur, nutrimental sulfur, rock phosphate, when they're first introduced to the soil, they're essentially inert. And the only way they get released to the, to the plant over the course of the growing season is either chemically with rock phosphate or biologically with both of them. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the theory and I'm, I'm pretty sure um, when we have time to figure that out, I'll, it'll be proven correct. Right, right. So another one on tissue samples too is, uh, when in the growing season should tissues be taken of crops, for crops? Well, I used to flippantly say any time's a good time to take a tissue test. I actually think the industry should be converting more and more of their analytical budgets to tissues instead of soils. Um, but practically, the best time to determine whether or not um, your biosol or your replenish is working and might need to be supplemented is at uh, the equivalent growth stage of early flag leaf or early bloom. The reason I say that is that if you've, if you've got a, a crop that's looking good and you take a tissue at early flag leaf or early bloom or the physiological equivalent in other crops, you still have time to correct any deficiencies that might show up, yet you still have a, a good, um, a good um, what's reflection of what the plant is experiencing at that critical growth stage. My opinion or my suggestion to the agronomists and farmers on the call would be rather than taking one tissue per field, would be to pick five or six favorite fields and tissue test them two or three times during the growing season and better than that, tissue test the old leaves and the new leaves because in one season of doing that, you will literally get a practical PhD in tissue test interpretation. And I can help you guys with that. So another question in regards to the micronutrients and specifically replenish. Uh, so say your soil's high in, a, in magnesium or boron or zinc. Would you apply, would you apply replenish? Well, the incremental amount of um, many of these nutrients that are in the rock phosphate uh, in this scenario um, would, I mean, how do I say this? You can't, you can't, it's almost impossible to have too much of any of those nutrients that just got met, mentioned, right? Yeah. Unless, unless you're in a very saline condition with way too much boron, that's a different story, but that, that's a very unique situation. So I would not let, I would not in the least let the content of these essentially free nutrients um, in the rock phosphate uh, hinder uh, the use of it because I, I can't think of a scenario where we could overdo stuff. I really can't. So in regards to the salt index of both products, how is that comparable to um, conventional fertilizers yeah so the rock <clears throat> the um, salt index of both biosol and uh, replenish is extremely low and i think the bulk of the salt um, that's contributing to that very very low number is likely coming from the compost so uh you know replenish and biosol are going to be kind of in that uh, three to five rating 
which, you know, if you compare it to other products uh, like ammonium sulfate or 1152, it's like a, a fraction of a fraction of their salt index. And so one of the things that I usually talk about earlier in the presentation is that one of the advantages of these products for some guys uh, is that the amount of salt we're adding is with them is pretty much the square root of um, very little. Great, great. I think the I think the replenish fact sheet's got has got the uh, salt index, um, and if my memory serves me, it's about three or three and a half or something like that, which is a fraction of typical phosphate fertilizers. And then for sure, biosol, it's kind of in the same ballpark. It's a even a smaller fraction of a typical ammonium sulfate program or, or something like that. Right. Um, another question, I guess, is why are my pH levels going up when I use this product? I haven't seen that one before. Is that from just a soil health aspect where you're taking salinity out of the ground due to not using conventional fertilizers so it, it's affecting the pH and having a positive response? I guess that's the, the question's vague. I'm just trying to. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, you know, that might be part of the answer for sure. But I think there's bigger forces at play. Um, if you're seeing large increases in soil pH, um, over the course of, of a, you know, a few seasons or something like that. Uh, there's got to be bigger things at play. Um, you know, there's nutrients that move up and there's new th that are mobile in the soil and some of them can contribute to fluctuating uh, pHs. I'd, I'd have to, you know, drill a little bit deeper into um, into the specifics of the issue, I have scarcely ran into that particular uh, situation. So there must be something else going on, or maybe we changed labs or, you know, simple stuff like two years ago, we took a, a 12 inch core and this year, or we took a six inch core and this year we took a 12 inch core or even, even simpler stuff. Uh, two years ago, the cores were, we got six inches and then this last year by, because we had a rookie soil samper, we got seven inches. Uh, those all, all can contribute to, and they can all contribute to the fluctuation of pH. Another one is the uh, analysis of the product. So yep. some, of, some of these things seem high, you know, is that actually what it's calculated over the ton rate? So I'll, I'll just answer this straight out. Yeah. So basically what we've done is we've done try to do a comparison of the industry, what they do and how they, um, how they qualify their analysis. This is over a ton rate. So yeah, we're high in sulfur obviously and calcium and copper and iron. So that's, that's what we're seeing from uh, independent lab tests for sure. I guess we've taken an hour here of everybody's time and uh, to be respectful of that and Elston's as well. I guess if we could end that on a high point here and appreciate everybody chiming in and taking their time to uh, ask some pretty intelligent questions. And if there's anything we can do going forward, everybody's got obviously their uh, dealer or partner contacts reach out. Like Elston says, he's, He's got his contact information. If you need to uh, email him or get him on the phone, you have a situational problem, obviously be more than welcome to help you out and talk you through some things that are maybe a little confusing or just need some clarification on. Yeah, I think, I think at the end of the day, Dax, I'm willing to stick around if there's more questions for sure. But at the end of the day, um, I hope I was able to, convince folks that biosol well, works and we've got tons of data to support that and most of it uh, I didn't have my my uh, sticky little fingers on so it's you know third party and stuff um, I think we pointed out that there's some other areas that 
as an industry, we should start thinking about and boron for me uh, and, and potassium are the two big ones I keep seeing over and over and over again in tissue samples. And I guess the, the, the other piece is that the, cons the concept behind micronized rock phosphate with micronized nutrimental sulfur uh, provides another tool in the toolbox to uh, kill two birds with one stone. Is it going to be a replacement for 1152 head on? Probably not, but it's sure as heck a good supplement, um, a building product for sure. And especially if you're in a, if you're contemplating getting into a, a biosol program um, supplemented with replenish, I think at the end of the day, the biology that we create in the soil, the, the various little feeding sites that we create in the soil that releases other nutrients to crops, I think. Um, we saw in some of the, you know, that one tissue example, some of the possibilities that, that, that are out there and, um, you know, pretty simple concepts, pretty simple products. And a lot of times the simple stuff is what makes the difference. So I hope I was able to convey that during this, uh, this hour of conversation. And there's my email and my my phone number. So if you want to text me or email me, please do not hesitate. Okay, awesome. Well, I hope, like uh, Elson said, everybody got their questions answered and uh, we'll leave it at that today. Sign off, obviously, everybody, as the world is what it is today. Hope everybody stays healthy and happy. Thanks for attending. Thanks, Dax. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>